Well, good morning. Is this on? Is it on? Okay, good morning. We're going to open with hymn number 65. It will be projected for Zoomers and for other people who just want to look up. But it is in the hymnal, number 65. Good old immortal, invisible, God only wise. Anybody else out there in the foyer needs an alert there? David, maybe let them know we're pulling up anchor, as Grady used to say. All right. Okay, Evan's going to open us with a, a word of prayer. Can you hear me? All right. Lord, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for the opportunity to gather together to worship. Um, thank you for the lovely weather. Thank you for all the people that are here. Uh, help us worship you. Um, help us bring glory and honor to you as we worship, as we hear from the word. Um, bless us in this time, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Evan. Uh, hymn number 65. Be seated. Well, good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we have visitors? I met one visitor, Lori. Is it? Did I get it right? Uh, Rachel's friend is here with us this morning. Good to have you. Other visitors this morning would like an introduction? Any chance? Seeing none. Okay. Norma, it's been a year. You probably slipped in for Christmas Eve or something, huh? Okay. Well, if you are a visitor, we'd love to have you fill out the tear off, and um, Pastor Brad, one of the elders, would follow up later in the week. Just get in touch with you. All right, let's take a quick look at the bulletin. Um, okay, tonight we'll have a mission report from, we'll just say from Valerie. Valerie's been working for 30 years in missions and uh, in a number of countries, and not all of them can be reported um, publicly. Um, so we, um, we're a little guarded about that, but she's a wonderful, lively speaker, and this church has supported her for many years. So, um, so that's at 6 p.m., and that will be by video. Sorry, okay. Will that video be on Zoom as well, do we know, or? to be decided. 
Uh, it looks like I'm getting a nod there. Yeah, okay, good. So it'll be a session on Zoom as well. You'll get the, the video there. Um, so uh, not as much fun as in person though. So come on out if you want. Okay, lost and found a bunch of articles there, uh, items on the, uh, on the tables in the foyer. It'll be out there for a couple of weeks. So check it out and see if you, that's where your iPad ended up. Um, so let's see, Young Adults, the Beam and Discussion Group will um, be continuing Friday night, 6.30 p.m. Luke is leading, continuing to lead that. Mission Opportunity, the um, Czech mission trip that this church has done for 13 or 14 years, Josiah Venture, um, is tentatively planned. Right, Rebecca? Is that, I don't know if you want to add. She's got a lot of information there. Um, but anyway, for the second half of July, 2021, and who knows, it might even coincide with some with a wedding. Um, uh, anyway, uh, consider that if, you, if you'd like, and talk with Rebecca more about um, some of the details that are still up in the air. But um, Okay, good. Church visioning meeting. So Saturday, yes, church on Saturday, March 20th from 8.30 to 2 p.m., um, we're just going to go over um, like a church mission statement and some ministry priorities for the next decade. You know, we have a new pastor. It's just kind of a time to, to um, you know, review those things and take a look and pray about that. So that will be happening mostly Saturday morning in a bit of the afternoon on March 20th. Child care provided and, um, you know, a wrapped sandwich lunch and so forth. So um, please come for that. We'd love to hear from everybody, you know, what your thoughts are, your visions, um, what God's put on your heart for our church. Okay. And uh, Will has just, the level of suspicion has risen in his mind to the point where he's changed all the locks. So, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist. Yeah. So, Oh, yeah, thank you. Okay, we're good. Okay, yes, I found out this morning the locks have been changed. Uh, um, I have like 20 keys, but none of them are. Anyway, um, yeah, so new keys, if, you're, if you need to, and it's not, you know, we trust everybody. It's just good to change the locks once a decade. The, to keep me out. Well, it's, you didn't succeed. I got a wife who has a key, so... Uh, anyway, yeah, so if you have a bunch of old keys or whatever, just chuck them. They're no good anymore. But if you do need to get into the building, it, it, you're, you're the first one here for something or just odd hours or whatever, totally just, I guess there's a contract about flushing the toilets before you leave and lights or something. But um, just uh, talk to Sarah or whoever else in the, in the office about getting a key. But your old keys do not work anymore, so that's important. All right. I think, and then the last announcement that we have is um, about the women's retreat, and I won't go into it. There's all kinds of great information here about schedules and speakers and sign up and so forth. Do, I, do we need to talk about this or is this pretty good for now? Mary? Since the retreat will be here and we are catering, we sincerely need you to register uh, before the, the week before. So we're hoping okay. all the women can make it. Yeah, it's gonna be a great event. Okay, any other announcements? Didn't make it, yes. Kelly, can we get her a microphone, please? On Thursday, you should have received an email from the church office about Right Now Media, and we started looking at this as a ministry, not only for our church body, but for our Awana families and even people that we come in contact with. So Right Now Media is, um, compared to like a Christian Netflix, it's a streaming library of, Bib of Bible study resources. It has an enormous children's library, Bible study, marriage, parenting, personal finance, mental health, and more. Um, some of the leadership here has been given early access and i am not advocating that you watch more tv however with covid i think we are all looking at uh, things on the internet more than we were in the past and it has 
it's just my kids have enjoyed it this weekend have enjoyed uh, exploring it but the reason we are asking for your email addresses is we lock in at a low price if we have around 45 people from our church sign up for this and i've been in touch with betty out in anvic and she's like kelly yes send me the codes once we get access because i want to share this with the people of anvic so this is not just for our body this is going to be a far-reaching thing to get good bible videos into people's hands mm -hmm. so if you did not get an email or you did get an email and you have not replied to me that you want your email shared please talk to me today send me a text thanks yeah Thanks, Kelly. Scripture reading this morning is going to come from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 21. Just stand as we read. Matthew 5, 17 to 20 through 20. Sorry. <laughs> um, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven." can be seated. <laughs> All right, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Andrea, for that, uh, that beautiful piece on the harp. And uh, it's, it's fun to see Valerie uh, and, and the way she speaks about spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. You know, the, that region of the world, I guess we'd consider kind of the ends of the earth. So, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Brad. I'm the pastor here at Eagle River Grace Church. And I wanted to start out our message this morning with a quick story. When I was in high school, this is going to be a shock to you. When I was in high school, I was part of the drama club. Is that a shock? No. <laughs> oh, Brad, I never thought you had it in you, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, I was part of the drama club. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. I really, that, I think of all the memories I, I um, have of, of that age, you know, drama club, uh, that's where a lot of my most fond memories are. Um, uh, Donna Kelly's brother, uh, Dave, uh, he was in the drama club too. So he and, he, he and I were on the cross country team. I have a lot of good memories of being on the running team. So uh, her family and, and my family kind of have that, that connection. Uh, so it's, it's kind of fun. Uh, so, you know, drama club's a good thing. It, uh, it forces you to get up in front of people and because public speaking is a, a great fear for a lot of people. Uh, and uh, it, it, it has you become part of a team that's a little different than a sports team. You know, you're still a team. Everyone has a part to play. And, uh, but, but the skills that you develop being part of the drama club are different than the skills that I developed by being on the cross-country team. But, but being in the drama club, of course, your job is to be an actor. And the goal of acting is to portray a character in such a way that the audience really buys into your character. Almost as if when they see you outside of the stage, that they would think that you really are that person. That, that's, what, that's the goal you want to strike. Now, unfortunately, one of the characters I played was this dim-witted hero. Uh, but maybe, you know, maybe there's some truth there now that I think about it. <laughs> the the dim-witted part. I don't know about the hero part. Um, uh, so, so what you're trying to do as an actor, you're trying to present somewhat of a facade, aren't you? You're trying to, you're trying to present yourself as being someone that you really are not. And, uh, and in our modern day, we've got, a, we've got a word for that kind of in the negative term, right? We've got that word, the word hypocrite. And that actually has its roots in the Greek of, of the acting world. And, um, and we're going to see a little bit of that today in our message. And, uh, you know, this week... This week, I have heard a lot of news about a very uh, well-known Christian apologist 
that um, that had a double life. The uh, the external life, the facade that you saw, was this was this righteous man who uh, who cared a great deal about spreading the gospel. And and um, however, uh, he had another life. Uh, he had a, a private life, a secret life, and um, that did not match uh, his public life. And it's it's actually pretty dark, and it's it's a sad story. Um, and so. I got a couple things I just want to say about that. Number one is this, is that, is that the power of the gospel is contained within the words of the gospel. It's contained within Jesus Christ. It's not contained within the lips of those people who speak it. Because any lips that speak the gospel, of course, are going to be fallible lips. Um, you've, you've asked me to be pastor, and I'm, I'm really happy that you have, but you've asked this, um, this fallen sinner, to be your pastor. And, uh, and so um, I'm in the middle of my sanctification process, as all of you are, and, and I'm growing in Christ, and sometimes that's a little rough. And um, it's, important, it's important in our church body to have some accountability. I, I think that's the second thing I wanted to bring up. I, I think in this man's life, there was, there was a lapse in accountability. There, there wasn't someone close to him to, to call him on certain things, most likely. And, uh, and I, I mention this every once in a while, um, the importance of church membership. Uh, being a member of the church, that, uh, that gives you a, a position as a member to hold leadership accountable. And leadership does need to be held accountable. That's, that's a good thing for the church. And, and... It gives permission for the leaders of the church to hold you accountable. There's mutual accountability there. And that, that serves to strengthen and to safeguard the church. And, um, and so there we go. There we go. There was just a couple words I wanted to share on that. Now we're going to meet another group of people in our passage this morning that, uh, that suffered from this condition of hypocrisy. And so I'm going to ask the Tech Force guys to call up my my slideshow this morning. Um, we're studying the book of Matthew, our continuing study of Matthew. Right now we're in verses 17 through 20, which Rebecca read to us. And um, uh, Jesus begins by saying this, that do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so, uh, you'll notice here in this passage, Jesus uses the terms law and prophets. Do you see that there? What does Jesus mean when he references both the law and the prophets? I think that's a good question to ask. Well, uh, when, when Jesus refers to the law, he's speaking of the law of God as given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And that law is contained within the first five books of the Bible, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Levit uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. Um, the, the prophets, that term incorporates the rest of the Old Testament, the, the history, you know, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, the wisdom literature, meaning Psalms and the Song of Solomon and the Proverbs, and then the, the prophetic writings, the, the minor and major prophets. And so when Jesus talks about or uses the term, the law and the prophets, he's referring to the entirety of the Old Testament. That's what he's referring to. And uh, in Jesus' statement actually brings up a very important question. And the question is this, how, how are we as Christians to understand and obey the Old Testament? How are we as Christians to understand and obey the, the Old Testament? Is that a fair question? Has this, has this question ever arised in your mind? Yeah, yeah, there we go. I'm seeing hands. This question comes up almost every year in Awana, because I do the junior and senior high guys, and that is a perpetual question that's asked. And so I'm actually excited to have some time to kind of uh, unfold an answer 
to that question. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. So, so to begin answering this question, we need to ask ourselves this, is, is what, does, what does Jesus say about the law and the prophets? That's a good place to start. What does Jesus say about the law and the prophets? First of all, he says he's not come to abolish them. That is something he has not come to do. And the, the word abolish means to either invalidate or to put aside, to discard. That's what it means to abolish. And, and really, this is somewhat of a curious thing to say right from the start. Right, right really? What, why bring up this topic, Jesus? Why are you doing that? Well, I think he's doing this because there must be something about what Jesus has to say in the Sermon on the Mount that may lead his listeners to believe that that is exactly what he's, he's advocating, a, a dismissal or a discarding or a putting aside of the Old Testament, that he's scrapping the old and replacing it with the new. But, but notice this, he emphatically, he emphatically denies that that is the case. Right from the very start of the Sermon on the Mount, he's, he, as if he's saying, do not be confused. Do not be confused. I have not come to set aside the Old Testament. That is not what I'm doing. He says, rather, that he's come to, to fulfill them. And this word fulfill means to, to bring something to its completion. Or, or its complete meaning, or its highest expression, to fulfill, to, to, to fill it up to its fullness. And then Jesus says this, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. The, so the first thing that Jesus has to say about the law is that he has not come to abolish it. That's number one, and we saw that in verse 17. The second thing he says is that the law is binding. The law is binding. A dot, a dot was the very smallest of marks in the Greek writing. It really is just a minor stroke of the pen. Okay, so that's, that's, what the, that's what is meant there by dot. And an iota was the smallest of all the Greek letters. And so by using these terms, Jesus is saying that not, not the smallest part of the law, not even the most unnoticeable aspect of the law will be changed or discarded. Rather, all of it is to be accomplished and finished. Now, in verse 18, in this verse here, it's important to note that Jesus begins to zero in uh, on the law. Do you notice that? In verse 17, it was law and prophets. Now, we're, we're, focused, we're focused more specifically on the law. And so I want, to, uh, I want to talk about the law here just briefly, okay? The law consists basically of three components, okay? There is the, the moral law, there's the ceremonial law, and then there is the civil law. And just so that we're not confused, I have a slide here that lists those there. The moral law, the first one, is that ethical standard that, that generally is captured within the Old Testament. Okay, that's the moral law. The ceremonial law are the prescriptions and the practices of Jewish worship, which include the, the priesthood and the sacrificial system and the feasts and the celebrations. And the civil law, the last one, that includes the, the regulations, those, those rules that regulated the behavior between fellow citizens in Israel and between the citizens and the government. So there we go. There's, there's just a brief description there of what's, what's encompassed by that term, the law. And we'll do more on that later. So moving on to verse 19, Jesus goes even further. 
Not only will he not abolish the law, not only is the law still binding, but third, we are actually to teach the law and to teach the commandments. And those who fail to do so will be called least in the kingdom. And those who do so will be called great. And so what do we make of all this? What do we make of all this? Sometimes, sometimes we as Christians may think that the precepts of the Old Testament are no longer relevant to the church in the New Testament age. Okay, sometimes we think that, but that is not true. Okay, that is not true. According to Jesus, it is still binding, and we as believers are instructed to teach the law and to conform to it. I'm going to say that again, okay? According to Jesus, it is still binding. The Old Testament is still binding, and we as believers are instructed to teach the law and to conform to it. However, and this is a very important however, so please don't miss this. However, the reasons we teach the law and the manner in which we conform to the law are different than the Old Testament saints. Let me repeat that, okay? The reasons we teach the law and the manner in which we conform to the law are different than the Old Testament saints. And so, that raises a question, what, what are those reasons that we teach the law? And what is that manner in which we are to observe them? Well, I'm going to endeavor to answer those questions. Are these good questions? I think so, okay. Uh, I will endeavor to answer these questions by, by reinforcing or by, not by reinforcing, I'm sorry, I used the wrong word, by referencing two aspects of the law. I'm going to reference the moral law, and I'm going to reference the ceremonial law for the sake of time, and, and because those are the two aspects of the law that are most taken up in the New Testament. Okay? Okay. So first, first is the moral law, God's moral law. Okay. Okay. What is the moral law? God's moral law is that body of ethical knowledge that is generally understood by everybody. Okay? The ethical law, God's moral law, I'm sorry, God's moral law is that body of ethical knowledge that is generally understood by everybody. Okay? You might be asking yourself, Brad, wow, I don't, I don't think that's right, but uh, I'm still tracking with you at least, you know, until I see you get it wrong. But, but here we go. Ready? Okay, before the Ten Commandments were ever given, Joseph knew that it was wrong to commit adultery. He even knew it was an offense against God. So how did he know that? How did he know that? Who told him that? Who told him that? Abimelech, a pagan king of the Philistines, knew it was wrong to lie. And get this, Abimelech, a pagan king, is reproving Isaac, a man of God, that he did wrong. You notice that? Okay. Even an idolater like Laban knew that it was wrong to steal. Okay? It gets, it gets better. It gets better. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, a pagan king, sought to bring justice to Moses, a Hebrew of all peoples, and God's spokesman, when it was discovered that Moses killed somebody. In all these cases, none of these men are privileged with the knowledge of the Old Testament. There were no Ten Commandments at that time to guide their ethical judgments. So, so the question remains, where did they come up with this knowledge? How did they know these things were wrong? 
How did they know? Well, this is how they know. They got the information from God. God gave them that information. Ethical knowledge is part of God's default programming. This knowledge is hardwired into our consciousness. Okay? Now, 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 just hold on. That's not to say that everybody obeys the moral law flawlessly. Right? We know that's not true. Right? So God did not hardwire this information in our heads by way of instinct. Right? We, it, this is not a knee-jerk thing. Instead, God hardwired it in our minds by way of intuitive reflection. Like, okay, intuitive ref- reflection. Right? That, that probably doesn't make it any more clear than before. So I'm going to explain intuitive reflection for you. Okay? What I mean with regard to intuitive reflection is, is all we need to do to understand the moral law is to reflect upon ourselves and our circumstances. And then we'll know what the moral law is. Um, And maybe you're in a position right now, Brad, I I don't believe you. I don't believe this is right. I don't believe this is real. Okay. Well, maybe this will help. Okay. It is often the case where we understand the reality of the moral law Better when it is violated than when we are the violators. Maybe I'll say this again, right? We more sharply understand the, remo- the, the moral law when we ourselves are the victim of its violation instead of the violator. For instance, okay, Jacob's uncle saw no problem cheating his son-in-law repeatedly. No problem at all. In fact, he stood to benefit from that arrangement, right? But... When Jacob decided to pull a fast one and skip town with his his family and his possessions, well, Laban knew that was wrong. Well, I better better go after him and make this right. Right? So so look, look, as as a child, it may seem all right to lie, right? Because the lie we know is an abomination to God, and it's an ever-present help in times of trouble. Right? So, so if I lie and I can personally benefit from that, you know, no harm, no foul. But I'll tell you what, I know for absolutely certain what's wrong when someone lies to me. Okay? All right, so there we go. So, um, and and we, use this, we use this type of moral discourse all the time. We use it all the time. And so, and so that all that's to say is that the moral law, it precedes the Ten Commandments. Okay? It was there before the law of Moses. Nonetheless... Nonetheless, it is captured in the Ten Commandments and other locations of the, in the law. In fact, even today, we encourage people to memorize the Ten Commandments because it is a good tool for us to memorize the tenets of the moral law. Right? That's something, Sagrada Bible Scholarship Camp. We memorize the Ten Commandments, and it's still relevant today to memorize the Ten Commandments. I hope you, who knows the Ten Commandments? You don't have to, look at that, amen, all right. All right. I didn't, for, the, for years and years and years, I could not memorize the Ten Commandments until I learned the song. And now, and now I know them. So praise God for music. So, amen. Okay. Um, so it precedes the law. It's contained in the law, and it is still in effect now. It is that aspect of the law that we're going to call transcendent. Right? It's given to all humans everywhere. It transcends cultures. It transcends uh, historical time frames. It's, it's always there. It's within the consciousness of every individual. And if someone doesn't align themselves with the moral law, we automatically think of themselves as social deviants, as people that are, that are, uh, are burdened to society because they, they just won't conform to the level of moral law. Now, now this is a blessing to us. It is a blessing to us because it's that shared body of ethical dialogue that uh, all nations have, regardless of their cultural or religious beliefs. It's, it's something we share in common. And so that we can have a common culture or a common ethical discussion with people from other parts of the world. And that, that really is a blessing. Um, now, now th- it may be it may be that some cultures or people group 
find no problem in violating these laws against other people and other people groups, okay? Uh, for instance, it's, I've never been a gypsy, but I've been told, okay, that within a band of gypsies, right, there's no problem cheating someone from outside my group of gypsies. That's no problem. In fact, that's what gypsies do. Um, however, what is wrong is to cheat a fellow gypsy. So, so within a culture or within a people group, these things always stand. These things are always there. Um, now, now, Jesus, to destroy this tribalism, he gave us, what, the golden rule that we should do to others as they would have us do to the, as we would have others do to us, right? Um, so, okay, so where am I going with this? In the New Testament age, that's where we're at now. The New Testament age, we are still to teach the statutes of the moral law, Okay. And to do so, it helps to memorize the Ten Commandments. And that's why we encourage memorization of those today. And we're told not only to teach them, but also to obey them. And so this, this subject of obedience raises kind of one last question in relation to the moral law. And the question is this. Didn't Jesus fulfill the moral law? And if so, are we truly obligated to obey it now? Is that a fair, those are fair questions. Didn't Jesus fulfill the moral law? And if so, are we obligated to obey it now? And the answer to those questions is yes and yes. Jesus fulfilled the moral law because he flawlessly complied with the terms of that law. And furthermore, when we place our faith in Christ, his righteousness or his flawless upholding of that law is allocated to our account. So it becomes our righteousness too. So we do not need to keep the moral law for the purposes of salvation. That's settled at the cross, okay? We uphold the moral law for other reasons. And I can think of three good ones, okay? Number one, Jesus says so, right? <laughs> Jesus said so, so let's do it. Number two, number two, we glorify God in heaven when, when our moral behavior reflects his moral standard. Right? We bring glory to God. The moon is the glory of the sun because it reflects the sun's radiance. Right? We can reflect God's glory, God's goodness when we uphold the moral law. And, and number three, and I think this is a real important one, okay? We become an effective witness to a watching world when we obey them. Because remember, this is transcendent. All people everywhere understand the moral law. And so when we as Christians violate that moral law, they know, right? They know. Abimelech knew. Abimelech knew what Isaac did was wrong. Pharaoh knew what Moses did was wrong, okay? And we don't want to discredit God's character by being in violation of these things. And so, and so really, here's the last question. What do we do when we do violate the moral law and the, an unbelieving world calls us out? What do we do then? What, what do we do? Well, we do the same thing we do when we discover through the scriptures we violated the moral law. We, we confess, Right? We're 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sin, we confess our sin. When someone calls us out, even when God calls us out, when an unbeliever calls us out, and we're wrong, we confess. We confess our sin. Like, you're right. You're right. That was wrong, and I'm sorry. You know, look, the, the, the watching world, they know the moral law, and they know they themselves have not flawlessly upheld it, and they know that no one else does. They're not looking for us as Christians to, to lead a morally perfect life. Really, they're looking us to lead a genuine life, right? Live genuinely. Okay, but we're not to live as hypocrites. We're not to have a, a secret life, right? The, the inward condition of our lives need to reflect that outward condition. So there we go, there we go. The other aspect of the law I want to touch on is the ceremonial law. And as I said before, this is the aspect of the Mosaic law that covers the priesthood and the sacrificial system. 
It includes the dietary restrictions and the mandatory feasts and observances, right? Those, that's the ceremonial law. Now, now, it's probably not news to you that we, we no longer worship at the temple. We're here in Eagle River. We're not in Jerusalem. In fact, even if we were to go to Jerusalem, there's no temple there, okay? That's another story for another message for another time, okay? So, so we're here, and when we came to church this morning, we didn't bring a goat or a ram or a calf or something to sacrifice before the Lord. Did you notice that? Okay, okay. Um, we eat ham. We eat ham. We eat sausage. I used to eat sausage. <laughs> right? Why is that okay? And we no longer observe or celebrate the Passover, at least not the way that the Jewish folks did back in the day. So, so the question is, Why? Why don't we engage in those religious activities? Well, in Jesus' own words, he has has fulfilled these things. They've been brought to their completion. They've been brought to their highest expression. And how has Jesus fulfilled these things? He's fulfilled them by his death on the cross to become our high priest. Okay? The reason why we no longer go to a temple in Jerusalem to worship is because now we have free access to God through Jesus Christ. Right? Worship to God is no longer spatially localized. The reason why we no longer sacrifice animals is because Jesus Christ is that great and final sacrifice which covers all of our sin in its entirety. The reason why we no longer have dietary restrictions is that our great high priest, Jesus Christ, has declared those things clean. Now, to go back to temple worship, to go back to animal sacrifice, to go back to the dietary restrictions, get this, is to live in practical denial of Christ's finished work and his position as high priest. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. Now, you'll remember when we were looking at Chapter 5, verse 19, we're told to observe the law. It leaves the question, how? How are we to observe the ceremonial aspect of the law? We observe it by recognizing that Jesus has fulfilled it in receiving him as our high priest. That's how we observe it. So, so in Ephesians chapter 2, when it says that, Jesus abolished the law and the the commandments, it it is not a contradiction to Matthew chapter 5, okay? Jesus abolished the dividing wall of separation between Jew and Gentile by fulfilling the ordinance of the law so that we are not bound to observe the ceremonial law in the same way that the Israelites did. But we are still, we are still bound to teach them. We're still bound to teach them because they set the foundation and the context with which we understand the crucifixion. So it's very important. I, anyway, I hope that clarifies things. This was helpful to me. So, all right, all right, amen. Okay, moving on. Moving on to verse 20. Jesus closes his dialogue with this statement. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, again, this seems like a statement out of the blue. Where where did this come from? And this is really really quite a statement of what Jesus is saying here. There was no one in Israel who knew the scriptures better than the scribes. And there was no one in Israel who followed the law with such precision as the Pharisees. And so to ask the common everyday man 
in Israel, that his righteousness needed to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. This was really an astounding statement. Well, I, really? So why does Jesus say this? I believe he says this because he is he's giving us a preface to the teaching of what's going to follow. Because Jesus is going to take up the commandments. And he's going to give instruction as in such a way to give his listeners the, the highest or fullest expression of conforming to that, uh, to that, um, to that standard, to the commandments. Conforming to the commandments is not simply an external activity. It's a, it's a heart condition. Right, right, and that's where the problem of the Pharisees lied. You might remember Jesus calls the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they're a squeaky clean. On the inside, full of dead man's bones. Right, they, Jesus is calling them hypocrites. What you are on the outside is different from what you're on in the inside. But my my prayer for us is that our external and our internal would match. Our private lives and our public lives would be one and the same. And so we're going to stop there. Uh, next week, Luke Magnuson is going to give the message, and he's going to continue our study in, uh, in uh, Matthew. And I don't want to steal any of his thunder, because I know he's got some thunder that he wants to unleash. So that'll be, that'll be great. So um, what's our takeaway from the message this morning? Okay, first off, uh, the Old and New Testaments are inseparable. Okay, they're inseparable. Um, together they reveal the entire counsel of God. The New Testament did not abolish the Old or set it aside. Okay, second, we are still bound to teach and observe the statutes of the Old Testament. However, However, the reasons why we teach the Old Testament and the manner in which we observe the Old Testament are different from those of the Israelites. We are to still uphold the moral law, not for the purposes of winning our salvation, but as a demonstration of God's work in our lives to those belonging to other cultures or religions or the watching world. We no longer physically practice the ceremonial law since these things were fulfilled in Christ. We do them, um, uh, to do them would be in a practical denial of Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross, so we don't do that. Rather, we observe them by trusting Christ has performed them on our behalf. Yet we nonetheless teach them because they set the foundation of the significance of the, of the crucifixion. And finally, Finally, our righteousness needs to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. We're not only to be clean on the outside, we're to be cleaned on the inside. So that our inside and outside match. That that whitewashed, clean external exterior would match what's inside here. And we'll touch on that next week. So how about I pray? How about I pray? Uh, Lord God, uh, it is a blessing uh, to be here. Uh, it is a blessing to consider uh, what Jesus has to say about the law. It's a blessing to consider your word. I pray, Lord, that uh, we would not live that double life. I pray that our public life and our private life would both be pleasing to you. And I pray that uh, we would not hide in the shadows, but let your light shine on all areas and aspects and compartments of our lives. And I ask this humbly in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Tell good news worth repeating Lift your head and keep singing Praise the Lord Years roll by And wonder why We lost our way
still was with the hurricane. Yeah.
now may the eyes of your heart be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called the riches of his glorious inheritance.